Now we are going to proceed with a more technical discussion and derivation of Feynman's ideas, uh, the Feynman path integral. And I should mention here from the outset that if you're not interested in these technical details or if you feel that your mathematical background is not sufficient to follow them very closely, you may safely skip uh, this and the following segment uh, because uh, uh, the rest of the course is not going to be heavily uh, uh, dependent on this particular derivation. But otherwise, I would encourage you to actually go through this derivation and maybe even work it out on your own after the lecture because understanding it would help you develop intuition not only about the path integral itself but about uh, quantum, mechanic, uh, quantum mechanics more generally. Now, uh, the object that we're going to discuss uh, in this particular segment is a so-called propagator, which um, uh, actually plays an important role in various uh, aspects of quantum theory. But uh, at this uh, level, we can view it uh, simply as an attempt to make uh, quantum mechanics as close as possible to the concepts that uh, we understand intuitively uh, in classical physics. And these concepts involve, for example, the notion of a particle localized in a point in space and the notion of a trajectory that the particle follows. Now, at the operational level, what uh, it is, uh, it involves uh, the following construction. So let's assume that uh, at an initial mom moment of time t equals zero, our quantum particle was localized uh, in the vicinity of the original point R sub i. So uh, by localized, I mean that its initial wave function psi uh, of zero t equals zero is equal to R sub i, this ket vector, which represents the eigenvector of uh, the position operator uh, corresponding to this point. Or in physical terms, it means that uh, this wave function is a very narrow wave packet localized uh, in the vicinity of this R sub i, very similar to the uh, wave packet that we saw in the very first lecture, in the last segment of the very first lecture. And uh, so this initial uh, state is going to evolve under the action of the Schrodinger equation, which is the standard Schrodinger equation with some kinetic energy and potential energy. And as we know from the first lecture, uh, so this evolution, quantum evolution, will involve spreading out of this wave packet with time. So it's instead of a localized sort of particle-like entity, it's going to become uh, like a cloud surrounding this R sub i, and this uh, spreading out occurs in a very non-trivial fashion in the presence of uh, potential. Now, the question that we're going to ask, uh, and which brings us uh, to this um, um, uh, notion of a propagator, is what part of this particle will propagate to a certain final point R sub f, or in other words, what part of this spread out wave packet will be located in near this point? And um, um, this mathematically implies calculating uh, the overlap between uh, the final wave function, psi of t, which again is governed by the Schrodinger equation, and this r, r, r sub f, which uh, describes a wave packet near this uh, uh, some other final uh, point. So, of course, I don't want to give you the impression that the particle literally propagates from a one localized state to another localized state. It does not. It actually spreads out in the quantum mechanical uh, language. But uh, uh, a part of this uh, wave packet will indeed uh, be located in, in near this point, and this is what we want to uh, calculate. And this overlap is uh, the propagator that we're going to focus on. Um, now, um, another question that we sort of uh, may ask is how will uh, the particle get there? How will the particle uh, go from the initial point to this uh, partially final point? So this question, strictly speaking, does really make sense uh, in the uh, context of the standard quantum theory based on the Schrodinger equation because there is really no notion of the trajectory which implies the ability to uh, uh, measure momentum and coordinate at the same time, which is not possible in quantum mechanics. But uh, as we will see uh, in this different formulation uh, 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 by Feynman, so this question sort of acquires a meaning. And going a bit ahead of ourselves, uh, uh, sort of let me sort of uh, reiterate or advertise again that what we're going to find is that uh, this particle uh, um, uh, uh, goes from this initial point to a final point, following all possible uh, trajectories that we can possibly imagine. So here are a few of those uh, trajectories that I plot. Now, uh, to, um, to, move, to move on, to actually calculate this uh, uh, overlap to this propagator, uh, clearly what we need to find is, uh, uh, well, the final wave function psi of t. 
we know the initial condition we, we sort of know what uh, the final state we want to get now we need to uh, well actually solve the Schrodinger equation which in general is very complicated but there is a formal solution we can uh, write uh, using uh, the so-called evolution operator so we're interested in uh, solving the uh, general Schrodinger equation um, uh, here with some initial condition uh, at t equals zero so I assume that we know the wave function at the initial moment of time so this of course is a completely general formulation which is not specific to derivation of any path integrals but well in our case uh, the initial condition we have chosen to be this uh, localized uh, wave packet uh, near a certain point r sub i so in any case um, well to solve the Schrodinger equation uh, uh, this time dependent Schrodinger equation basically means to find the uh, wave function as a function of time psi of t and uh, the evolution operator that I just mentioned uh, is uh, formally relates um, the uh, initial condition to the final wave function psi of t so its action is exactly in some sense rotation from psi of zero to psi of t I use the word rotation having in mind this geometric picture that we introduced last week to motivate uh, the Dirac notations uh, you know this cat vector is psi of t which uh, in some uh, are meant to represent uh, a sort of a vector, abstract vector in a linear vector space uh, corresponding to the state of a physical system. Now, um, if we did have uh, a sort of garden variety uh, linear vector space uh, as our Hilbert space, which normally is uh, very multidimensional, so we can't really draw the axis, but if we had if we imagine for a second that we have let's say just three axes and there is a state uh, psi oops, psi zero which represents our initial state so the norm of this vector so the absolute value squared of this vector uh, sort of corresponds to the total probability of finding uh, our quantum state our quantum particle in a certain state and uh, well from uh, the board interpretation we can say that this probability is equal to one we will find the particle if it's there in some state so uh, the norm of this vector should be uh, uh, preserved as we uh, perform a quantum evolution so in some sense the only thing we can imagine uh, this vector doing as a function of time under the action of the Schrodinger equation as uh, is its rotation you know by some angle uh, to a certain new uh, state psi of t and uh, this rotation the operator which sort of enforces this rotation is exactly this evolution operator again so here I'm just trying to represent this in an intuitive way in general if we're dealing with the uh, generic quantum mechanical problem there is no way to draw it because we have uh, well, an infinitely dimensional Hilbert space but still at some level this uh, picture is preserved so this evolution operator rotates uh, a normalized uh, uh, state which describes a particle to uh, a different state which describes the same particle now uh, it turns out that we can actually instead of writing the Schrodinger equation for uh, the wave function we can as well just write the same Schrodinger equation for the evolution operator the only thing we have to do is just to plug in uh, this uh, uh, equation into the Schrodinger equation we're going to see that uh, we have essentially the identical equation for the evolution operator so h uh, u of t and uh, uh, the initial condition for this equation is uh, u uh, of 0 is equal to 1 uh, where 1 is just the identity operator so why uh, well uh, it's sort of follows in a very simple way from its definition so if we look at this equation we see that the evolution operator sort of evolves our initial condition to a final state but well if t is equal to zero there is nothing to evolve we just stay where we were and so therefore psi of zero is equal to psi of zero so u of t is equal to one and this is sort of the initial condition we can uh, enforce and uh, one can guess in some sense or just pick a, a general solution uh, to this uh, matrix or operator equation which satisfies both, uh, both the Schrodinger equation itself and the initial condition by writing uh, u of t as uh, an exponential of minus i over h bar h uh, times t so um, well t equals 0 e uh, exponent of 0 is equal to 1 so it does satisfy the uh, required initial condition 
and if we plug it into this equation so if we uh, differentiate this sort of ansatz with respect to time so um, well differentiating the exponential sort of pulls out this coefficient minus i uh, over h bar times h uh, so minus i times i is equal uh, to 1 h divided by h is equal to 1 so we're just going to have h e to the power minus i h bar h times t which indeed is equal to h times u therefore indeed so we satisfy the required Schrodinger equation so an interesting uh, and sort of attractive uh, feature of this evolution operator is that it solves uh, the Schrodinger equation with all possible uh, initial conditions in one go because the uh, evolution operator itself does not actually depend on the initial conditions so we see that it has a universal initial condition at u equal at t equals zero u is equal to one so for instance here in this geometrical uh, interpretation if we had let's say different uh, psi of zero let's say this will be psi of zero uh, well uh, prime so uh, the uh, evolution of this other initial condition in this sort of Hilbert space would be a rotation by the same angle around the same axis well to a different psi of t let's say psi t prime here uh, but the evolution operator that would enforce this uh, rotation will be exactly the same as before so to be, it, will, it will be exactly the same u of t so uh, in our case in particular so we're interested in uh, knowing how uh, this uh, particular initial condition evolves with time and uh, therefore the wave function would be equal to e to the power minus i over h Hamiltonian times time acting on this initial condition so this is sort of a exact and universal solution of the Schrodinger equation whatever it is with this initial condition of a localized uh, particle in certain uh, region in space. Now let us go back to the main question that we posed uh, in the beginning of this segment, namely the question about uh, the um, uh, overlap between uh, the wave function psi of t sort of propagated from uh, the vicinity of the point uh, r sub i and uh, the, a wave packet localized in, in uh, the vicinity of the point r sub f. So what we found in the previous slide is uh, a formal exact expression for this psi of t. So psi of t is the action of the evolution operator on the initial condition r sub i, and therefore if we put two and two together, the uh, expression for the uh, propagator is going to be the following matrix element. It's going to be rf. Here we're going to have this evolution operator ht r sub i. So this guy is simply this psi of t. And so we get uh, the expression that we're actually going to use in the next segment uh, to derive um, the Feynman path integral. So Feynman path integral is uh, another representation of this matrix element between uh, Rf and Ri of this operator u of t. So at this stage you may ask me why would we bother to uh, uh, look for any other expression for the propagator apart from uh, the one we just derived which looks pretty compact and simple so the answer to this is that this simplicity is uh, deceptive because uh, the main object here this evolution operator involves uh, uh, exponentiating uh, an, a, an operator the Hamiltonian and to actually calculate uh, such an exponential of an operator uh, exponential of a matrix is a rather complicated exercise and in general even to define uh, the uh, exponential of an operator is a tricky business. So uh, as a side comment here, let me remind you that uh, for an arbitrary operator a matrix X, in our case this X is this minus I uh, over H bar HT, so its exponential is defined via uh, the Taylor series, so it's 1 plus X uh, plus X squared over 2 uh, plus X cubed uh, over 3 factorial plus etc. And so to calculate this series uh, with matrices operator is uh, rather uh, complicated. And so uh, the Feynman approach, uh, as we will see, essentially uh, circumvents uh, the need to calculate this complicated exponential and truncates the series uh, uh, right here. Uh, and uh, basically the end result, as we will see, will be uh, an expression that doesn't have any operators whatsoever. 
And not only that, the final result also will have uh, a very clear intuitive interpretation that we already sort of advertised uh, in the beginning of this lecture.